All right, class, welcome to chapter five. So chapter five is all about Diomedes Aristea, okay? So Diomedes, remember, is the youngest Achaean warrior, and Aristea is a fighter's finest mo moments, especially in battle, okay? So um, remember in book four that we ended on, uh, we had Pandarus. He, is, he started the war again. Athena tricked him into it. And in the part that we skipped in book four, we have Agamemnon. Um, he has um, different, kind of differing um, success in getting his men to fight. So once again, we have Agamemnon kind of, sometimes he's good, sometimes he's not so good. But we jumped all the way through that to Diomedes because this is one of the uh, most famous passages in the Iliad. So let's go ahead and start reading. There, to Tydeus' son, Diomedes, Pallas Athena granted strength and daring that he might be conspicuous. Conspicuous means noticed, right? Among all the Argives and win the glory of valor. And she made the weariless fire blaze from his shield and helmet. Like, that's one of those similes that I love to do again, like the star of the waning summer who beyond all stars rises bathed in the ocean stream to glitter and brilliance. Um, such was the fire she made blaze from his head and his shoulders and urged him into the middle fighting where there was the most struggling. All right, note real quick here, I changed this to, to blue because I forgot that I like to do that in a different color. So what this is saying is that Athena gave Diomedes strength, okay? And it's strength enough to make him noticed. Now, something here that's interesting that you might ask is, why fire? Why fire? Well, maybe fire has to do with strength, okay? Or maybe you remember the story of Prometheus, who stole the fire from the gods. And so fire kind of has this relationship, <coughs> excuse me, to the gods. And so maybe you kind of think about that and you realize, well, um, fire here could mean strength. It could have something to do with the gods. It'd definitely be something interesting to talk about. So let's continue. There is a man of the Trojans, Darius. Blameless and beautiful, a priest consecrated to Hephaestus. So Hephaestus, right? So Darius is a priest to Hephaestus. And he had two sons, Phaegus and Adios, well skilled both in all fighting. These two, breaking from the ranks of the others, charged against them, riding their chariot as Diomedes came on and dismounted. Now, as in their advance, these had come close to each other, First, of the, the first of the two, Phaegus left and let his spear far shadowing, let go of his spear far shadowing. Now, what's interesting here is so um, you have the two battles, battle sides, right? You have one, one, you have two sides, kind of a battle. And what was often done here is you'd have people come out from the sides, okay, and fight each other, okay? And these one on one contests were actually fairly common. And so this is kind of what's happening here. Another thing to note here is what do you think foreshadowing means, right? Well, foreshadowing is, is it the is it the shadow, okay, of the spear that is the is the is the length of the throw? Or okay, is it the size of the spear? right and how far the shadow um casts when the spear is standing up something interesting i wonder what far shadowing means and those are a couple of possibilities so over the left shoulder of Tidius's son passed the pointed spear nor struck his body and diomedes thereafter threw with the bronze and the weapon cast from his hand flew not in vain, but struck the chest between the nipples and hurled him 
that's Viegas from his horses. So, Viegas dies. And Adios, the brother, leaping, left the, for, the fair rot ch chariot. Rot just means made, so it's a, it's a well-made chariot. Nor had he the courage to stand over his stricken brother. So I runs away. Okay. Even so, he could not have escaped the black death spirit, but Hephaestus caught him away and rescued him, shrouded in darkness, that the aged man may not be left altogether. So Hephaestus rescues Adios so that his father is not left without um, without any children. Okay? But the son of high-hearted Tidius, that's obviously Diomedes, right? So the son of um, high-hearted Tidius drove off the horses and gave them to his company to lead back to the hollow vessels. Now, as the high-hearted Trojans watched the two sons of Darius, okay, so that's the two men, right? One of them running away and one cut down by the side of the chariot, right? We saw that happen. Anger in all of them was stirred, but gray-eyed Athena took violent Ares by the hand, and in words she spoke to him. Ares, Ares, manslaughtering, bloodstained, stormer of strong walls. How's that for some epithets for Ares? Shall we not leave the Trojans and Achaeans to struggle after whatever way Zeus' father gants glory to either, while we two give ground together and avoid Zeus's anger? Okay, so Athena convinces... Ares to stay out of the fight because this is something that Ares would have been attracted to. So she spoke, obviously that's Athena, and led violent Ares out of the fighting and afterward caused him to sit down by the sands of Scamandros. That is a river near Troy. While the Danans bent the Trojans back, and each of the princes killed his man. So this is a so the Achaeans um, have good moments here, and what you're going to see is a bunch of Achaeans kill um, the Trojans. By the way, I forgot to put this. This is Athena speaking right there. So let's see who kills who. Well, first of all, Agamemnon. He's going to get a kill. He hurls tall Adios, the lord of Halzones, from his chariot. For in his back, even as he was turning the spear fixed between the soldiers' shoulders and was driven through the chest beyond it. Okay? So note here, this is going to be a pattern just FYI, we have the way he dies, or he's wounded, okay? The spear is between the shoulders and through the chest, okay? So we have our guy, right? Here's our dude, Mr. Troop's Amazing Drawing. Here comes the spear through the shoulders and through the chest, okay? Also note that we have uh, a sentence that says that he dies, right? He fell and his armor clattered upon him. That's death. So we're going to look for this pen. There's going to be a pattern here in the next few um, examples. So here we go, next one. Idomeneus killed Phaeostos, the son of Maonian Boros, who had come out of Tarne with deep soil. Idomeneus, the spear renowned, so he was known for the spear, stabbed this man just as he was mounting behind his horses with a long spear driven in the right shoulder. Okay, so once again, here's, I'm not going to draw it this time, but this is how he 
is wounded or the, the, the wound that kills him. And this is a sentence saying that he dies. He dropped from the chariot and hateful darkness took hold of him. So that's obviously death, right? Hateful darkness. The henchman. So henchman just means the helper, right? The helpers, okay? A henchman is often like like evil helpers, like bad helpers, like gangs, but it's just helpers, okay? Okay. Of Idomeneus, strip the armor from Fiestos, because this was common at the time. You win a battle, you take their armor. And here we go. While Menelaus, son of Atreus, killed with a sharp spear Strophius's son. A man of wisdom in the chase, Scamandrios. Now, note here, this Scamandrios might sound similar to this Scamandrios up here. This is a river, and this is a person. I get it. There's only one letter difference in between them. But that's the way it is. Right? So Scamandrios was the fine huntsman of beasts. And then we have another little backstory here, and I always like to do a little bit of something of backstory, so I'm going to go here. So Artemis himself had taught him to strike down every wild thing that grows in the wild forest. So I just like to put a little backstory there. There's, there's other backstories around. I don't always mark them, but when I recognize one, I like to mark it. Yeah, Artemis of the Showering Arrows, right? Remember, she's the arch. She um, is famous for use of her archer. She's the huntress, right? Could not now help him. No, nor the long spear cast in which he had been preeminent. Preeminent means first. Okay, so even his skill and Artemis cannot save him. But Menelaus, the spear famed. Okay, so famous for the spear, right? You can see here we have a couple dashes. This just means uh, first place. This means famous for the spear. The son of Atreus, there's his epithet, stabbed him as he fled away before him in the back with a spear thrust between the shoulders and driving it through the chest beyond it. And he dropped forward in his face and his armor clattered upon him. Now I want you to notice something. Agamemnon, right? Spear fixed between the shoulders and driven on through the chest and the armor clattered upon him. Menelaus, his brother, spear thrust between the shoulders and driven through the chest beyond it and dropped forward in his face and armor clattered upon him. So is this the same as Agamemnon. And I'm guessing, it's just my guess, that this is because the poet, okay, these are brothers, and he's memorizing, and he just gave them the same kill, basically. All right, next one. So Meriones, in turn, killed very close, the son of Hermonides, the smith, who understood how to make with all his hand all intricate things. Okay, so once again, I think we're going to have a little bit of a backstory here. So I'm going to start my backstory. Okay, that's a backstory there. Since above all others, Pallas Athena loved him. Okay, so Athena loved him. He, it was who had built for Alexandros. Alexandros is Paris, right? Um, moving down here. Where am I moving to? There we go. Ships. Okay. The beginning of the evil, fatal to the other Trojans and to him, since he knew nothing of the gods' plan. So, this here, okay, Marionis built the ships that uh, let me erase that. That stole Helen. What? This man, Marionis, pursued and overtaking him, struck him on the right buttock. You know what? I think I made a mistake here. Pharaclos is the one who built the ships, right? Moronis is the one who does the killing, so it's okay. You make mistakes sometimes. Sometimes you have to go back. So, so Pharaclos did that. Okay. So Moronis is the one doing the killing. Pursued Pharaclos and overtaking him, struck the right buttock 
and the spearhead drove straight on and passing under the bone into the bladder. Ooh. All right, so this is his death wound, okay? And then once again, and he died, he dropped screaming to his knees and death was a mist about him. All right, so this one directly says death on this part, okay? So that's a kind of gnarly one. So we're kind of racking up some different deaths here, some different deaths. We got a few through the back, one into the bladder, okay? There's gonna be some even better ones coming up. All right, next one. Meges in turn killed but Padaios, the son of Antenor, who bastard. Bastard just means um, mom was not married. All right? He was nursed by lovely Theano. So that would be the wife of his dad, right? With close care as for her own children to pleasure her husband. So basically, um, Padaios was dad asked his wife, even though it wasn't his mom, to take care of it. That would kind of be hard to do, knowing that you were taking care of somebody that your husband had an affair with. With close care. All right. Now, the son of Phileus, Spearfane, closing in on him, struck him with a sharp spear behind the head at the tendon. And straight through the ground, through the teeth, and under the tongue went the bronze blade. Whoo! And here you go. And he dropped to the dust. That's his death, gripping in his teeth the gold, the gold bronze. Now this might be the most epic one yet. You've got a skull, right? There's the nose, All right there. Once again, Mr. Troops, amazing drawings. And the spear went through here and through his mouth, just like that. That's pretty gnarly. Eurypylos, your man's son, killed brilliant Hempsnor, the son of high the high-hearted Dilopian, who was made Scamandrosis. So, guys, this is the river, okay, priest, and was honored about the countryside as a goddess. This man, Eurypylos, the shining son of Eumaean, running in the chase as he fled before him, struck in the shoulder with a blow swept from the sword and cut the arm's weight from him so that the arm dropped bleeding to the ground and the red death and destiny powerful took hold of both eyes okay so this guy's arm is chopped off and in that day that's a death sentence because they don't have modern medicine stop the bleeding and all that fun stuff okay so he dies as well so they all went went at their work about the strong encounter, but you could not have told on which side Tidius' son was fighting, whether he were one of the Trojans, so remember that's Diomedes, or with the Achaeans, since he went storming up the plain. And here we go. I'm going to do this because this is another beautiful simile. Like a winter-swollen river and spate that scatters the dikes in its running current. One that the strong, comp compacted dikes can contain no longer. So this is a river. A dike is something that tries to hold the water. Okay? So it's going across the things that try and hold it. It's spewing over them. Imagine that the army is trying to hold Diomedes in, and but they can't. Nor do the mounded banks of the blossoming vineyards hold it rising suddenly, as Zeus's rains makes heavy the water and many lovely works of the young men crumble beneath it. So, D, Diomedes, is like a swollen river that overruns. And if you've ever tried to stop a swollen river, good luck. You don't. You don't stop all that water. All right? So he's unstoppable. And like these mass battalions of Trojans were scattered, owned by Tidius' son, that's one skin Diomedes, okay, many as they were could not stand against him. Now, as the shining son of Lycoan, oh, here's Pandaros again, right? watched him storming up the plain, scattering the battalions before him. At once he strained the bent bow against the son of Tidius and shot and hit him 
as he charged forward in the right shoulder in the hall of the corset. So, Pandaros hits Diomedes with an arrow. All right, and the bitter arrow went straight through, holding clean to its way. It's a clean wound. Now, normally when we get a clean wound, it's not going to be lethal. And the corslet, that's the thing that you wore on your chest, was all blood splat spattered. And the shining son of Lacoan, remember that's Pandaros, said aloud in a great voice. This is what he says. Rise up, Trojans, O high-hearted lashers of horses. Now the best of the Achaeans is hit, and I think that he will not long hold up under the strong arrow if truly Apollo, the lord and son of Zeus, stirred me to come forth from Lycia. Okay, so he's bragging a bit. And you can see this here by this word. So he spoke vaunting. Vaunting literally means bragging. So Pandaros is bragging. But the swift arrow had not broken him. Only he drew back again to his chariot and horses and stood there speaking to Thanelos, the son of Capaneus. Okay? So he just drops back. Okay? And he's regrouping. Come, dear friend of Capaneus, step down from the chariot so that you may pull out this bitter arrow. So he asked Capaneus to pull out the arrow, and so he spoke, uh, the son of Capaneus, Stenelus, to pull out the arrow, and Stenelus sprang to the chariot from the ground, to the ground, from his chariot, sorry, and standing beside him, pulled the sharp arrow clean through the shoulder. Have you guys ever taken a fish hook out? I've done a couple, because fish hooks hate me, okay? You can't pull it out, so you have to push. So like I had a finger once that had an arrow, so you have to put, uh, not an arrow, a fish hook. You have to push it all the way through. That's what you do with an arrow. He pulled the sharp arrow th clean through the shoulder, and the blood shot up, spurting through the delicate tunic. All right. So Di Diomedes isn't dead, but he's not in exactly great shape. Now Diomedes, of the great war cry, how's that for an epithet? Spoke aloud, praying, "Hear me now, Atritone." That's another word for Athena. Daughter of Zeus of the Aegis, remember Aegis' is shield, if ever before in kindness you stood before my father through the terror of fighting. So here's Diomedes talking. He's praying, actually. Be my friend now also, Athena. Grant me that I may kill this man. Who's this man? It's Pandaros. He wants to kill Pandaros. And come within spear cast, who shot me before I could see him, and now boasts over me, saying that I cannot l live to look much longer on the shining sunlight. Something I might ask here, if I was reading through this and had class, is something like, is archery considered cowardly? Right? Is archery considered power? He's saying he shot him before I could see him. I don't know. Maybe not. But I would wonder about that. So he, that's Diomedes, spoke in prayer, and Athena heard him. She made his limbs light again, and his feet and his hands above him. And standing close behind him, she spoke and addressed him in winged words. So here's what Athena's going to say. Be of good courage now, Di Diomedes, to fight with the Trojans, since I have put inside your chest the strength of your father. His father was a famous warrior from the previous age, untremulous, such as the horseman Tedius of the Great Shield had. And I have taken away the mist from your eyes. And I'm going to do that because I wanted to find that. That before now was there, and now you may recognize the god and the mortal. This mist here, okay, so Athena opens Diomedes' eyes to see the difference between God and man. 
so he can see. Okay, is it a god or a mortal who's coming against him? Therefore, now, if a god is making trial, so if a god making trial, this means attacks you, okay, and comes hither, do you not do battle head on with the gods immortal? Don't attack gods. Unless, okay, I'm jumping ahead here. Not with the rest, but only if Aphrodite, Zeus's daughter, comes comes as fighting, or at least you may stab with the sharp bronze. So unless it's Aphrodite, and pay attention next, that, that's gonna come to play here in a little bit. She, right, Athena. She spoke thus, great Athena, and went while Tydeus' son closed in once again with the champions, taking his place there, raging as he had been before to fight the Trojans. Now the strong rage tripled, so he's three times as strong, took hold of him. All right, and here's one of those, gotta do it, similes again, as of a lion, whom the shepherd among his fleecy flocks in the wild lands graze as he leapt the fence of the fold but has not killed him but only steered up the lion's strength and can no more fight him off but hides in the steading so as a lion the lion attacks the flocks the shepherd tries to kill the lion but he has not killed him and he runs away hiding and the frightened sheep are forsaken and these are piled pell-mell on each other's heaps while the lion raging still leaps out again over the fence of the deep yard. Such was the rage of strong Diomedes as he closed with the Trojans. So Diomedes was like an enraged lion among sheep. Right? Next, he, that's Diomedes, killed Astanaios and Hyperion, shepherd of the people, striking one with the bronze-sealed spear above the nipple and cutting the other beside the shoulder through the collarbone with the great sword, so that the neck and back were hewn free the shoulder. That's strong. Why is that strong? Well, um, if you know anything about executions you know that um chopping somebody's head off is actually incredibly hard to do it takes a lot of strength so going through the sh neck and back and the shoulder would be incredibly hard to do he left these men and went after Poly Pol Polidos and abbas sons of the aged dream interpreter Eur eurydimus yeah, for these two, as they went forth, the old man did not answer their dreams, but Diomedes, the powerful, slew them. So here it's just saying that um, the old man was a dream interpreter, right? And it's just saying that the old man was not there to save them or did not answer their dreams. Now he, Diomedes, went after the two sons of Phenops. These two would be Xanthos and Thoan, full-grown both, but Phenops was stricken in sorrowful old age, nor could breed another son to leave him among his possessions. So what this is saying is that Phenops has no more children. And he has no more ability to have more children. So these are the last of his line. There he killed these two and took away the dear life from them, leaving to their father lamentation. This is sorrow. Uh, and sorrowful right there. Affliction. Sor lamentation is actually more like mourning. So you could substitute mourning in for sorrow there. Since he was not w to welcome them home from the fighting a life still. The, and remoter kinsmen shared his possessions. So what this is saying is that because um, the sons of Phaenops, the last sons, were killed. Some remote kinsmen, somebody else in the family, got the inheritance. Right? Right here. Next, he, once again, Diomedes, killed the two children of Darnum Priam, 
So Priam, this is the king of Troy. Okay. Who are in a single chariot at Cameron and Chromius. And here's one of those similes again. As among cattle, a lion leaps on the neck of an ox or heifer that grazes among the wooded places and breaks it. So the son of Tidius hurled both from their houses hatefully, inspired the struggles, and stripped their armor and gave the horses to his company to drive to their vessels. Okay, so Diomedes is like a lion breaking necks. Okay. All right, so this next person, Aeneas, is actually an interesting character. Aeneas, okay, is actually the main character of the Aeneid, a book that we read in, um, uh, sorry, in the spring. Aeneas actually plays a fairly minor role in the Iliad, but the poet Virgil, a Roman, takes Aeneid, Aeneas, sorry, out of the uh Homeric tales, okay, and basically claims that Rome is related to these great Greek myths by making Aeneas the father of Rome. So just something to keep in mind. We'll talk about it in the spring. Now, as Aeneas saw him, once again, that's Diomedes, wrecking the ranks of warriors as he went on his way through the fighting and the spears' confusion, okay, so he saw him wrecking the ring Rings wars, looking as if he would find Pandaros the godlike. Look and see if he could find Pandaros. So Aeneas is trying to find Pandaros. And he came upon the strong and blameless son of Lycon, that's Pandaros. He stood before him face to face and spoke a word to him. So Aeneas is talking. Pandaros, where now are your bow and your feathered arrows? Where are your fame, in which no man here dare contend with you, nor can any man in like you claim he's better. So Aeneas is saying, Pandaros is the best archer, right? No man can compare with you. Come then. He's continuing his speaking. Hold up your hands to Zeus and let go an arrow. So hold up your hands means pray to Zeus and let go an arrow at this strong man, Diomedes, right? Whoever he may be, who does so much evil to the Trojans, since many and great are those whose knees he has broken. Unless this be some god who in wrath with the Trojans for offerings fail to fix them. The wrath of a god is hard to deal with. This is a key passage for me. First of all, because it acknowledges that the wrath of a god is difficult, and this is the, um, a very true statement. But it also shows that that um, the Trojans aren't sure whether Diomedes is actually Diomedes or a god. That's how powerful he is right now. Then, in shining answer, the son of Lycoon, that's Pandora, spoke to him. Here's what Pandarus says. He does it for quite a while, so I'm just going to do P right there. Aeneas, charged with the councils of the bronze armored Trojans, I liken him in always to the valiant son of Tidius, going by his shield and the hollow eyes of his helmet. So based on his armor, it looks like Diomedes, and by the look of his horses. But it may be a god. I am not sure. And if this is a man, I think the vigilant son of Tidius, yet not not without God does he rage, not without God does he rage so, but some of, of the immortals mantling in mist in his shoulders stands close beside him. So we already know, okay, this is Athena, is helping out Diomedes, okay? Who turned my flying arrow as it struck elsewhere, away from him? Right, Athena turned back the arrow from Menelaus, and it doesn't say specifically so, but it's a good chance that she directed the arrow to hit Diomedes. For I have shot my shaft already and hit him in the shoulder, the right one, hard driven through the hollow of his corslet. And I said myself that I had hurled him down to me, Idonius. This is Hades. Yet still I have not beaten him. Now this is some god who is angered. 
but I have no horses nor chariot that I could mount in, and yet somewhere in the great houses of Lycoan are eleven chariots. So he's still talking this whole time. And what I want to note here, too, is he's going to kind of give a little bit of a backstory, right? I have no horses or chariot to ride on, okay? And yet somewhere in the great house of Lake Cohen are eleven chariots, beauties, all made new, okay? And over them blankets lie spread, and beside each chariot one brace of horses, that's a pair of horses stand there, champing with their white barley and oats. But like Cohen, that's his father, the aged spearman, spoke to me over and over as I was on my way, away from the house, well compacted. That's a nice house, well compacted dirt or gravel. Advising me, he told me to take my horses and chariots, and riding there to be lord among the Trojans and the strong encounters. I did not let him persuade me, and that would have been far better, sparing my horses, who had grown accustomed to eating all they wished from going hungry where the men were pinned in a small place. So, he's saying, and he's going to continue to say, I don't have horses, okay? I don't have horses. No horses. Now, why does that matter? Well, he's going to say it right here. So I left them and made my way on foot to Ilion. So he has no horses, trusting his bow, a thing that was to profit me nothing. So the bow has done him, if its profit hit him nothing, it's useless. He's calling his bow is useless. Now he's the greatest archer, right? For now I have drawn it against two of their best men, Tidius' son, that's Diomedes, right? So Diomedes and son of Atreus, that's Menelaus. Okay, and both these I hit, and drew physical blood, yet only wakened their anger. So, Pandora's hits both Dominus and Menelaus, but no death. He just made them more angry. So it was bad luck that I took from its peg the curved bow on that day when I carried to lovely Ilion. What Diomedes is saying here is that it was a waste of his time to actually get that bow, right? Uh, at the head of my chosen, bring the light to brilliant Hector. We'll talk about Hector soon. You'll meet him. Now, if I ever win home again and lay eyes once more on my country and my wife, okay, if I ever lay eyes once more on my country, okay, let some stranger cut my head from my shoulders if I do not break this bow in my hands and throw it in the shining fire. Since as a win, nothing have I taken, um, nothing have I taken it with me. So this is the end. That was a long part that he talks. Let me make sure I have the whole thing. It keeps going there. All right, so that's a long speech by Diomedes. Now, it's interesting here that Diomedes is saying his bow is useless. I think he might have realized that he started the war. So Diomedes, I think, is sorry for his actions. And I could be reading into it just a little bit here, but it seems like Diomedes is realizing that his actions have been foolish. It was very foolish for him to listen to Athena. Did he have a choice? I don't know. But it, nevertheless, it was very foolish for him to listen to Athena and shoot the arrow at Menelaus and start the battle up again. All right, that's all we have time for today. We'll pick this up and a further reading. Take care. Bye.